Hi, I'm Ben Massenberg. I'm a resident in plastic surgery at the University of Washington, and I'm here with Dr. Nivaldo Alonso, who is a professor of plastic surgery at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. Welcome and obrigado. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Nivaldo. Well, Ben, that's a, a great pleasure to be here with you and uh, also uh, to try to make some uh, kind of advertisement for the International Society of Craniofacial Surgery. It will be my pleasure. Thank you. Um, so today we'll be talking about Tessier facial clefts. And to start our discussion, what do you think have been the largest changes in care for patients with Tessier facial clefts since you have been in practice? Well, that's uh, it's very interesting because uh, uh, almost 30 years uh, ago, we are just trying to close clefts and uh, and uh, was like uh, uh, big scars outside the aesthetic uh, units. So it means that we improve a lot the aesthetic uh, final results. We have long term follow ups, and we improve the the quality of uh, uh, restoration of this facial skeleton and soft tissue. So uh, I I would say that the the final results functional and cosmetic are better, and the scars are in much better position. One of the most uh, challenging was eyelids reconstruction because of the eye exposure, the coronary exposure. So after many years and many cases, we we change it. Now we have a protocol for eyelids, lower and upper eyelids, and just depend on the size of the defect. We we used to make a, a better reconstruction than before. Great. So it sounds like previously it was just all about closing the cleft, but you'd leave big scars in the middle of the face and end up with eyelid complications. And now the scars are more aligned with the anatomic subunits and, and there's much more attention paid to the eyelid reconstruction in particular. Perfect. Your translation is perfect, Vic. Thank you very much. Of course. And what do you think now that we know what we do know um, with anatomic subunits and that sort of thing, what are the biggest challenges currently that we face as a surgical field taking care of patients with Tessier facial clefts? Well, it's, uh, uh, well, the biggest challenge for me is uh, always a uh, uh, long-term follow-up for this patient because uh, most of them uh, have uh, uh, unusual clefts. Uh, I, 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 as I said before, at the beginning, we have very few of these cases. Now, after many of them, we learn a lot of how to do the reconstruction and put these cars in a good position. But at the end, it's like a cleft lip and palate. You have to follow this patient for more than 18 years. It means that uh, uh, like most of my patients, we need to do like uh, nasal reconstruction or redo nasal reconstruction. We, we have to do like orthognatic surgery at the end of the facial growth. So I think the biggest challenge for this patient is uh, at the end of uh, 18 years or 19 years, I the final facial growth uh, to have a, a good uh, cosmetic and, and, and functional res result. So my, the big ch biggest challenge is not like uh, only eyelids reconstruction, nasal reconstruction, but also uh, to do all these things and, and put this uh, uh, patient uh, again back to the society. I think this is the big challenge for these unusual clefts. Right. And, and, and I would add to this is just the reason for this is much more uh, difficult to do the rehabilitation of these patients. Uh, when you talk about cleft lip and palate is, uh, is because not just the lip uh, and the palate is involved, but all the facial uh, structures is involved in this correction. Right. And so moving forward, where do you think we are heading in the future for surgical care? Do you see any new techniques or new perioperative care pathways for patients with Tessier facial clefts? Well, uh, what uh, we, we, we have seen all these years is that many of these uh, are genetically related clefts, that some of them are, are like uh, related to the period of pregnancy. But uh, we, we have seen like Amy Arania and Irania that they 
they have uh, uh, some genetic conditions. So what I'm I'm, I'm saying is uh, we know much more that, uh, about these diseases. So we feel not that uh, we are following some uh, uh, new challenges about uh, previous uh, antenatal uh, diagnosis and uh, and uh, prognosis for this patient. So I think. Uh, this is one of the things that we, we 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 can see now that we could not see this before because of the number of the patients. So uh, like uh, I, I work in two big craniofacial centers here and we have more than uh, uh, 1,000 of these patients. It means that uh, now we have uh, like a, a classification for some of these diseases, some of these deformities, and we have a uh, genetic studies for all of them and uh, we have uh, more protocols for treatment uh, and at the end we we can uh, uh, know a little bit more about the cleft than we 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 did before 30 years ago well that's exciting dr nivaldo i certainly look forward to seeing kind of the research that comes out of your group with with that kind of numbers you can kind of help everyone else that doesn't see the same volume um, and thank you so much for your time for chatting with me. And I look forward to seeing you at the meeting in September. It will be my pleasure to be in Seattle in September 3. And thank you very much, Ben.